All right. Today for Real Talk with QBV, we are joined by longtime pro quarterback, Michelaud Bethel Thompson. Michelaud played in the NFL for a while with a bunch of teams. He's played in a few other leagues as well, um, including the CFL. So thanks, thanks for joining us today, Michelaud. My pleasure. Appreciate having you. Anytime we can talk quarterbacks, I'm, I'm on board. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. So the first, first thing we want to talk about is um, your most recent experience in the Spring League. And those of you, those of you who don't know uh, about the Spring League, the Spring League is a developmental league where a lot of guys will go and play um, just to kind of give themselves more film or development for um, NFL or CFL. So just kind of talk about um, what that was like this season. I know it's, it was an interesting season for the Spring League. Yeah, you know, there, there a lot of things happen and, and, you know, I speak about some and won't speak about others. But what the biggest, you know, takeaway that I have um, is that there's a lot of good football players out there and there's a lot of good football coaches out there and that there's a huge market um, and a huge need for a developmental league um, in the United States of America. You know, um, there's if there is a can and there can be a sustainable football league uh, developmental league, it will make the CFL better. It will make the NFL better. We're seeing now um, a lot of guys step into the field on Sundays in the NFL and not perform. There's a huge difference between the pro bowl level and the established vets and that next tier of player, whether it be at the quarterback position or at other positions. Um, they're just not, they don't have the experience and they don't have the tools to perform at that level. And college can only prepare them for so much. So what I did learn through the spring league is that there's a lot of good players out there that need that development, that can use that, that time under center or that time taking snaps at every position, and it will make the NFL game better. Um, so there's players out there, and I hope that there's a league that can form that can be sustainable and, and provide that platform for people. Yeah, absolutely. I I agree. I've definitely there's definitely been a lot of good players in that league. Some good talent. Uh, I think today either a kicker or a punter just got just got picked up. So that was nice. that's pretty Very pretty nice. cool to see. Um, since you know since you were all, you guys played what two games? You were able to get two games in. Three. We played three, three. and then it fell apart. And I believe the championship is later this yep. month. I I won't be playing, but the championship is later this month. Right. Right. So what have you what have you been doing personally just to kind of stay in shape, kind of stay ready for that, for your next um, opportunity? Oh, you know, uh, everything, everything in every way. And, and I've, I've gone through all types of forms of, of training uh, throughout my career from heavy lifting to not as much lifting to more band work mm -hmm. to um, all of it. So I, I kind of incorporate little pieces of everything and add little, little stuff to my game. So there's always something I'm learning and building. Um, I think the best form of quarterback training is just going to a park and throwing the ball. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any substitute for it. Um, and throwing the ball over and over and over and over again to a moving receiver, to a stationary target, to whatever you can find, just um, honing in on your craft. And, and um, there's always something to work on. There's always that, that spin off the fingers that you're – it's like a, an avid golfer, right? You know when the shot feels right, um, and you're constantly chasing that. So – um, I go to the park, you know, a couple days a week and I toss the rock and then I do different forms of, you know, agility training or adding this to my game. And I, I just, I study trainers and I study, um, athlete, you know, perform, performance experts and try to pick up a little something each week. And, um, yeah, there's always, there's always something you can add to your game. Right. Yeah. I, I like that a lot. I feel like, especially with, uh, kids now, they don't, a lot of them won't go to a park. They'll just kind of rely on other people and rely on um you know rely on their friends or their coaches they don't they don't have a lot of them don't have that initiative but I, I would definitely like to see a lot of today's quarterbacks kind of do that more go to the park play some pickup football backyard football I feel like that's like you said it's just getting the throws to the moving targets standing targets things like that absolutely I think I think the the quarterback position is about finding out who you are and I think that um that is a process and the better you are as a quarterback, the more you understand who you are. I think that um, Russell Wilson understands his strength and he understands his weaknesses and he accentuates his strength. But if Russell Wilson tried to be Tom Brady, he wouldn't do, he couldn't last. He couldn't, you know, he wouldn't make it because mm -hmm. he's a different form. And just like Patrick Mahomes is a different form and Aaron Rodgers, the, when they play at their best is their most, uh, most authentically themselves. And I think that's a physical journey, but that's also a mental journey. 
and to be honest, a spiritual journey as well. And quarterback is such a um, all encompassing position. You know, you have to have all three kind of in balance that the more that they can just figure out who they are <laughs> at a park by themselves with friends um, in any form and fashion, I think that's, that's their best, um, best opportunity to, to be their best selves and be the best quarterback they can be. Yeah, hundred percent. Couldn't agree with that more. And, you know, during right now, like mid COVID um, with all the restrictions and here in Massachusetts, um, they just went back to phase three. So there's even more restrictions around here. Um, so what are some things that quarterbacks should be doing during these tough times with not having the typical amount of resource that they would usually have? Yeah, it's definitely, it's hard, you know, and, and, and but like I said, it, it's the, the most beneficial stuff is the simple stuff. Mm. And so if you do have a friend that you can go to the park with, you can social at distance and you can throw a ball back and forth. There's nothing better. And just hone in on the basic parts of it. Um, if you don't have a friend that you can go to the park with, um, one of my favorite drills is literally lying on your back and grabbing a football and throwing the mm. ball in the air and feeling what it feels like to just spin off your finger and see yep. if you can spin it up in the air and have it come down and hit you right in the face and spin it up in the air, have it gravity come back and hit you in the face and then take your right elbow and attach it to the ground and now spin it up and spin the ball and have it come right down. Just that simple feeling of it. You know, it's like a, a mm -hmm. jump shot, a jump shooter shooting his shot, right? They want to feel it roll off the fingers. They want to feel it go into the hoop that can be worked on literally lying on your back um, by yourself in, in the backyard. And between that combination of that little flick, and a strong core um, and feeling that snap, that dissociation between your hips and your upper body um, and working on ab movements and throwing med balls or just doing sit-ups or um, working on different rotational stuff uh, between that spin off the fingers and that rotate, that strong core. That's where quarterbacks played. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, to go back a little bit, Last year, 2019, your season in the CFL, you had over 4,000 yards and you had a crazy season. So I just want to talk about that a little bit. Like, what was it like? What was going through your head? What kind of you felt like made you succeed as well as you did for your that 2019 season in the CFL? You know, I, I, I what a crazy season. What a, what a yeah. roller coaster of events in so many ways. But I kind of look at my CFL experience um, – in three years, um, all three of the years I spent up there, um, going up there my first year and kind of riding that journey on a, on a great cup championship and then having two struggling season backs to back where we didn't win very much. Um, I kind of touched on a little bit what, what it takes to play quarterback in terms from a physical, mental and, and really spiritual uh, situation. And, and those three years in Canada tested me in all three forms and fashions. Um, I was... I was had some really high highs and I had some really low lows and it really taught me and reintroduced me and, and re focused me on myself and how I can't control a lot of the circumstances. I can't control a lot of the stuff around me, but what I can control is who I am and how I wake up every morning and how I attack my work and how I attack my game and how I add to it every, every single day. And I'm really proud of the fact that through all that tumultuous situations, I improved as a football player. I found a way to get better. I found a way to conquer myself. We all have, um, uh, you know, a little, little voice in our head. That's a negative. It's a negative Nancy. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know if you're allowed to swear on this podcast, but I call it like your, your inner bitch. Like every day you have this little voice in your, in your head. That's like telling you what you can't do. Or telling you what, if you mess up now, you know, three months down the road, you're going to be here. It's like that little ego that's talking mm -hmm. to you. And when you can defeat that voice, when you can get that under control, and you can fight and push that down and, and attack each day with a calm and a poise, um, it's, it's really beneficial. And it took three years for me to get there. You know, it was a lot of up and downs. And, and I had played a lot of good football last year. Um, I played a lot of bad football last year, too. Um, but I was proud of the way I fought through it. And, and I think stats don't lie, you, you know, go back and watch the film. I, I would, I would put that film up with anybody, um, good and bad, you know, um, um, I, I pride myself on being able to spin the football. And I think just now, you know, be, you know, I'm continually adding to my game and I'm learning how to play the quarterback position every year. So, um, I don't know if I answered the question, but yeah, I, I don't know if you can answer the question. Those are three crazy, crazy years. 
and last year was a roller coaster. I, um, in 10 years, I'll be writing a movie about last year, and and it's going to be better than any hard knocks or any, any given <laughs> Sunday you can even imagine. It's going to be the ins and the outs, the ugly, the, the happy, and everything in between. So wait a couple of years, and the movie will come out. Oh, that's we we're uh, we're very excited to very excited to watch that. That should be good. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So yeah, um, now going back even even further, a couple of years to your your college days. So um, you know, your freshman year, you're at UCLA, then you transfer to Sacramento State. So talk about what that uh, transfer process was like for you. Man, what a what a big question. Um, yeah, I think you have to even go back to understand. So understand who I was coming out of high school to understand my college journey. Um, so I was, I love football from, the, from when I was about six years old, I went down to, I was, I was born in the Bay area in San Francisco. I went down to see my two big cousins play who played football in long beach in, in Southern California football, which is big time football. And I went down to see a playoff game and I don't know, I was maybe six, seven, eight. I don't know exactly my age, but I remember it very vehemently just like, you know, 20,000 people in the stands, mm. Friday night football, plus my big cousins who were my heroes. I was like, this is all I want to do, man. This is the Mecca. This is it. Uh, football is king and, and it's the greatest sport there is. And, and um, I had that in me. I was like, man, football is what I love to do. And my mom wouldn't let me play. So I begged from that point on every year, every day, every, and I played a little flag football here and there, but I wasn't allowed to play tackle. And her plan was I was going to walk on in college. City College of San Francisco has a really good junior college program. I was going to wait till I was fully grown and then walk on in a junior college. I was like, Mom, that's, that's not how it works. Like, <laughs> that's not how it works. So finally, by the time I was a sophomore in high school, I started playing tackle football. And I transferred high school to a school that had football. Um, and through a whole bunch of tumultuous, crazy events, I ended up starting on varsity as a sophomore, my, my first year ever playing football. And it was just – a trial by fire and I was literally just dropped in this and I was, he was like here kid figure this out um and it was crazy it was it was it was trial by fire and it was ups and downs and it was everything in between and by the middle of my junior year I feel like I'd figured it out kind of I was like oh I get it you know, <laughs> throw it to your guys you know don't throw it to the other team that's stuff like that where it's just like I it was a crazy process by my senior year we went to the championship my junior year of the section championship my senior year of the section and I was kind of a big fish in a small pond and my recruiting process was was crazy up and down all the way back and forth and I'm getting a, a chance at UCLA and I meanwhile this is like very inner city bad news bears kind of public high school football I remember on JV they would have players run off give their helmets to another mm -hmm. kid and the other kid would run back on the field like no joke that's the level of football yeah. we were at great talent great people great coaches great players but it was underfunded it's public yeah. school football um and it was, it was brutal. Uh, and then going to UCLA, I was like, wow, this is the Mecca. Like, I got two helmets. I got two pairs of pads. I got 16 pairs of cleats. This is crazy. Um, and, again, I was kind of dropped in this environment. It was like sink or swim. Like, what the heck is going on? I'm at UCLA. I went from Bad News Bears football to Pac-12 <laughs> football. They got every resource you can possibly imagine. Um, and I redshirted, but I was just scrapping. And I was I, – I was – used to being uncomfortable and I think that was really beneficial for me because of the way I learned how to play my sophomore year and high school I then was dropped in my freshman year my second year at UCLA and I'm playing six games and I was comfortable I was used to being uncomfortable football always felt uncomfortable to me so going to Pac-12 I was like well yeah I'm uncomfortable again they're faster they're bigger they're stronger I played six games as a freshman um, at UCLA and then the coach got fired and I decided to transfer. So one of my quarterbacks coach back home put me in contact with Sacramento State. The coach reached out to me. He's like, I really see your talent. Uh, I was in the NFL. Give me three years. I'm going to get you to the NFL. I'm going to, I'm going to get you there. I, I see it happening. Um, and I was like, that's really attractive. Someone that wants me, someone that, you know, is, is, is going to invest in me. Unfortunately, he ended up being a mentally and physically abusive coach and it was a really hard years and there's another level of transition and change and injuries happened and all that type of stuff uh but I wouldn't change it for anything again I think that that roller coaster adventure and finding yourself through the highs and the lows um and finding out who you are and how you work um and when you're at your best and when you're at your worst and conquering that inner that inner demon every day is kind of a, a theme throughout my whole career that was kind of a long tangent but I hope it covered your question 
Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that's it's definitely one of the most unique uh, stories you'll find out there, especially for a quarterback. Um, definitely, and then just, I mean, the whole transfer process too. That's obviously, like you said, it's just about finding yourself, and that's that's something a lot of guys will will struggle with, and it's definitely a, not an easy process. I know myself; I went through it three times. So, uh, yeah, it's just it's interesting to hear um, that experience. And I think it's a different – we're in a different time, right? I think that there's now a transfer portal. It's right. a different thing in transferring yeah. now, too. It's much more common, and it's uh, it's a different nowadays. And I and I would just encourage anybody who has transferred, I, I wouldn't second-guess them or I wouldn't mm -hmm. belittle them or I wouldn't say anything that is wrong or bad. I mean, I did it myself. I would just encourage them to, like, well, what do you – what is your goal, you know? And what is your goal for transferring? And what is your goal for playing college football and – what ownership are you taking over your game? Are you just looking for a greener pasture on the other side of the fence? Because it's always going to be greener on the other side of the fence. It's always going to look good over there. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is conquer yourself and improve your game and take little things every, not fear failure, not run away from failure, not try to find the easy path, try to find the strength to take the hard path and make it worthwhile. Um, I think that's, that's such a valuable kind of, reframing of how you approach yourself like i don't care if i fail but if i fail forward if i'm improving um if i'm strong enough to you know fail and then get up and do it again that's what the greats do i mean everyone's russell wilson's transferred you know aaron Rodgers transferred. the amount of guys that have gone through that but they're always failing forward you know they're always they're always building themselves and they have that level of inner confidence that they they see a vision and they're going to go attack it yeah Hundred percent couldn't couldn't have been um, said better. And so now after college, um, you know, what are, what are some things that kind of put you on the radar for some of these NFL and pro teams? This is uh, the journey. You see, you start digging, and it just gets weirder and weirder and weirder. And, and by the end of this thing, you'd be like, well, "How did this guy survive? Like, what is going on here?" That's what. We're... Um, <laughs> so I I tore my ACL my sophomore year. Um, I came back my junior year. I played well and had some good hype going into my senior year. Um, there's some a bunch of crazier stories involved in that, and we won't we don't have time to go through that. But those three years were were the most bizarre. One well, some of the most bizarre years of my life. But anyways, played good in my junior year. Had some scouts come around my senior year, and I was the guy for the senior year. And I was like, you know. I saw the NFL scouts in spring practice. I saw, like, I was like, oh, this is something. I, you know, maybe mm -hmm. it's there. First game of my senior year, I blew out my ankle against Stanford. Um, my coach blocked my medical red shirt because he was trying to get the graduation rates oh. up. Blocked my medical red shirt and then canceled the pro day that spring because he didn't want any guys getting looks. I don't know what the deal was. Anyway, um, and I, I was like, man, like, what do I want to do? Like, there, well, there's no reason I should think that I have a pro career ahead of me. There's, there's, but there's nothing else I want to do. And I'm really thankful to have a really strong support network and a really mm -hmm. loving parents and, and loving sisters and, and brothers that really, you know, are there to guide me. And, and my parents took me aside and like, what are you going to do? And I said, well, mom, I really want to play football. Like that's all I've ever wanted to do. And I said, well, take six months, you know, we'll support you for six months. We'll see what happens. Take six months, attack, look at all the options. What can you do? You know, grind, put the work in and go see what, what's on the flip side of it. And if, you know, after six months, there's nothing, then you got to go get a job. That was kind of the deal. So within six months, I, I left school. I graduated in December. Um, I left school in January, and I just started driving. And, and there was this arena team in San Jose called the San Jose Sabercats. And I, luckily, I had a connection through Sacramento State. One of the – Aaron Garcia, one of the great quarterbacks, um, played in the arena league a long time. And I threw with him, and, and you put me on the field with anybody and I can out throw pretty much anybody that includes NFL quarterbacks. That's pretty much anybody. I take a lot of pride in the way I spin the football. Um, so he's like, wow, you can, you know, there's a look like, go check it out. So I drove every day from Sacramento to San Jose, which is about two and a half, three hours, depending on traffic um, about three or four times a week. And I just kept showing up. I kept showing up and I kept showing up, I kept showing up, ended up getting invited to training camp that spring and made the team. I beat out a couple other quarterbacks and I made the team to back up Mark Grieb, who's another arena league legend. He played, you know, 16 years in the arena league, won multiple championships through for, I don't know, 70 some thousand yards, just crazy career. It's great. And he really taught me how to be a professional and how to approach the game um, and how to approach your teammates and how to, 
show up every day with a, a matter of respect and, and hold your teammates accountable to a level of excellence, but also be genuine and be yourself. And I really am very appreciative for Mark Green and what he taught me. I played a couple of games here and there as he got kind of banged up that year. So I got to play some games. It did pretty well. And then Jim Harbaugh, who recruited me out of high school when he was at University of San Diego, had just gotten the 49ers job. Mm -hmm. So he brought me into camp as a camp arm. And that kind of like, it was a huge step up and huge foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And from there, the, the NFL slash professional journey continued and it kind of was the, the lift up I needed. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You were just talking about it a little bit, but after your NFL, you had a journey through many different teams. So how was that with your family and keeping your friends and kind of picking up and just moving every time you got something or a different team or something else, another new opportunity came up? How was that with like, how did you deal with that? And I, cause I know I can imagine it's a lot of stress not seeing the loved ones and your friends and just talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah really good. And then really bad. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> It was it was crazy. I, I from there. I went to the UFL, played there, the Mountain Lions, and I went to the Dolphins, and then um, Vikings, and then kind of bounced around everywhere. So at the beginning, it was like, man, like it was such a great adventure. It was like a new city, a new challenge, a new something to work on, something to add my game. And I was a little wide eyed, um, and you know, kind of overwhelmed. I was like, well, I'm just so excited to be here. How can I get better? And then once I established myself in Minnesota and I, I worked up to be the backup and I was in the realm and I was in the, the running, I was like, now I felt like I was an established NFL quarterback. Um, I kind of, for whatever reason, I got mixed around at that point, but my mentality had switched. I felt like I would belonged. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was owed something. I felt like I had made it and I needed to push on. And I think, as those cuts and those changes, because you, you can get cut and it can be for no reason at all. Some, some people get cut and be like, you're just not good enough. I was never told I wasn't good enough. It was always about wrong time, wrong place, wrong situation. Um, um, sorry, um, wrong place, wrong situation. Um, and so I felt like my mentality had switched where it's like I was owed something. I was... Um, and then the cuts kind of, I, I lost the starry. I lost the competitive edge. I lost the fact that I was, was learning something new and it became easy for me. And I became a little bit complacent. And, it, and the cuts, I started distancing myself from it. It's like, man, I'm going to get cut again. And I was in, 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 expecting it and more involved with it almost too much um, in some ways. And so... Um, I think then I started ingraining and, and at times I performed like I was going to get cut because I knew it was going to happen anyways. So I think some of the good bouncing around and the fun part um, was really positive and really beneficial because I got to see the world. And then I started to internalize it and I started to have like cuts define who I was as a person. Yeah, definitely. That's great. You answered it perfectly. That's exactly what I was wanted there that was expecting there was a lot of journey a lot of stress a lot of everything going into that so now as you talked about you were how you were talking you just say you were the backup in minnesota and you were on a couple different practice teams and for i'm sure a lot of people who are going to be watching this don't know exactly what a backup does and like what his job is and what it's like being on a practice squad so can you talk a little bit about your experiences with being a quarterback in the nfl and on the practice squad yeah, this is, and this goes back to our beginning point, why there needs to be a developmental league in the NFL, for the NFL, is mm -hmm. because the starter gets 95, 90, 95% of the reps during the week, because there's only so many reps, so they need to get him ready. The backup runs the scout team and runs the opposing team, so he gets a considerable amount of football, not necessarily the plays that they're going to be running that Sunday, but gets competitive football against a professional defense, which keeps him crisp, which keeps his timing on point, the third guy doesn't do anything, really throws, you know, me balls on routes on air, throws to, you know, some, some drills he can work in. They're doing all the individual stuff. They're doing all that stuff, but they don't do anything else. And it's really why you see these guys go out on Sunday and, and perform really poorly at times because they, they literally are running new plays that they haven't run that run. And they're in a competitive environment and the timing is there where they, they haven't experienced that timing enough. 
So that's kind of what the three. And so the it's, it's hard to get that second job. There's only 32 starters and there's only 64 if you can include the backups. Outside of that, it gets real shaky in terms of experience, in terms of seeing what that is. And that jump is really huge. And I never quite established myself with that 64. Um, this may sound braggadocious. It may sound arrogant, but I'm better than some starters in the NFL. If you line me up and throw the ball, I'm, I'm better than a considerable amount of starters in the NFL. And I'm better than a lot of backups. But that 64 is very political. It's very right time, right place. It's mm -hmm. coach has to be comfortable with you. Coach has to yeah. trust you as a first tr coach has to trust how you move in the world, know who you are, be comfortable with you coming in because you're not going to get a lot of reps. You're not going to get that. And so they have to know that on Sunday, they're going to put the product out there. The starter goes down, you jump in, you as a quarterback are going to make them look good so that they keep their job. So that, that jump from three to two, I was never in a situation long enough or performed well at the right time to make that jump. At times I was the backup in Minnesota. I was the two for a playoff game. Game time. And I never got that status as that top 64. And I think that as a whole, if you took that third spot and the fourth spot, that's not even on the roster a lot of the time and put them in games and got them playing, you would see a lot better product and a lot more quarterbacks make that rise and improve out of college. And you, you saw it when we had NFL Europe, you mm -hmm. saw Kurt Warner, you saw Mark Bolger, you saw Jake DeLome, all these guys Bill that Walker. won and won championships. They all played in NFL Europe. They all got that experience. Um, you're seeing it now with PJ Walker with Carolina, you know, a guy who came in and looked comfortable because he just played, you know, six, seven, eight right. games at a professional level. Um, and so that jump is really huge from three to two. Um, and, and I think that development elite could be really beneficial for that jump. Absolutely. Absolutely. And over, over your years, do you have a particular, uh, favorite route concept? Oh man. <laughs> uh, four verts. There's four verts <laughs> with, a, with a check down balloon. There's nothing that can stop that. You run that out of three by one, you run that out of two by two, you run four verts. And I tell you what, as a quarterback, this is what a lot of younger quarterbacks don't do and what they should just look down the field at the four verts and run the, throw the balloon to the running back. You can run that 90% of the coverages. You just take a three-step drop, look down the field and then find the running back on an option balloon over the ball. You're probably going to, you know, 70, 80% of the time, you're going to find a completion and you're going to get seven, eight, yard, nine yards and maybe you'll break it and run for 20. Uh, you could probably run that down the whole field. Uh, the majority of the game, but the fun part is throwing the verts. So uh, give me four verts out of any coverage. Um, and I actually, I was in in, in Miami and uh, the coaches asked Dan Marino, who was in our, our meeting rooms a bunch. Um, and Dan's an awesome guy. And he said, fuck, four verts, of course, when asked that question. So uh, I'll, I'll take what Dan, what Dan says and, and copy that. Right, right. Can't go wrong with that. Can't. Can't. But, all right, so a little – you just talked about the drill where you were laying down and that you said you enjoyed – that was one of your favorites. So what would your favorite drill be without any COVID, with no circumstances that are in? What was one of your favorite drills that helped you did throughout your years or you're still doing currently that have, you think helped you the most? Um, oh, there's too many to, to name. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say one that I'm doing right now, and this is, a, this is something I've just done for the past – maybe two months or so, maybe a month or two that I really enjoy is uh, there's two things that I start every warm up with. So the first thing is that the first 30, 50, 60 throws of the day are no laces. So I don't touch the laces like for the that. first time. You should be, you should be really comfortable with that. So while you're warming up, you're not going to throw the ball as hard as possible. Anyways, why are you grabbing the laces? Why are you getting a perfect grip on the ball? So I'd say the first, at least 30 throws of the day should be no laces. And then what I'm working into is after about 20 throws, I do 10 throws on my left foot and 10 throws on my right foot. And my, if I'm on my left foot, my right foot can't touch the ground. So I'm literally on one foot, balanced on one foot, and I'm just working on rotation. And if that right leg swings or doesn't swing, or if it's stationary, whatever it takes for me to stick that, that left foot in the ground, it is really good for proprioception. 
It's really good for ankle balance, which all quarterbacks should be fanatical about, is being comfortable and gripping your toes in the ground, huge proprioception. So I do 10 throws without letting my right foot touch the ground, and then I'll switch to my right foot and do 10 throws without my left foot touching the ground. As you get more comfortable, you're able to swing your leg bigger, your, op, your one that's in the A, that, that swing can get bigger because you've got more attachment to the ground there, um, and you can spin the ball farther. And so I would challenge all younger quarterbacks, I bet 90% of them can't do that drill and not touch the right foot to the ground. So those two things. First, 30 throws of the game, the laces, and then try 10 throws on the left foot, 10 throws on the right foot without – and catching it too as part of the appropriate session. So throw it to somebody, they throw it back to you, you got to stay on one foot and catch the ball. Um, it really works on your balance. I mean, that's solid. I know a lot of our younger QBs, every time we do a, some quick release drills, are always trying to find the laces. So it just kind of even says that so proves that, that you need to be comfortable in throwing the ball no matter what you have, kind of grip you have on it. So that's really good to hear. All right. I haven't really this, – this question is kind of hard, and I've, I'm, I'm expecting – I don't know what I'm expect, expecting the answer to be, but you've played through a lot of teams. You've met a lot of people. Who is one of your favorite teammates or, team, or teammate or teammates that you've had on a team, CFL, anything? Oh man, there's there's really too many to uh, yeah. too many to name, and by naming one, I feel like I do a disservice to mm -hmm. um, all of them. But um, who's the you know somebody that I play with that I have a lot of respect for and haven't seen them in a long time? Well, there's two. There's too many. My favorite team has too many. Josh McCown. Josh McCown's one of the greatest humans mm -hmm. um, that you can cross, and he's just an awesome person, genuine from inside out and just a pure soul that really loves giving knowledge and sharing knowledge, a really powerful person. Um, him and Alex Smith are two of the best humans that you can be around. They're great people. They're great football players. They're great quarterbacks. But above all else, they're great humans. And so those two guys, I, I think I just would do a shout out to those two. Um, and then I will want to pick out two running backs too, because running backs are always characters. <laughs> so there's a lot of good ones, but uh, Frank Gore is one of the most – loves football more than anybody else in the world. And what a, what a great character. We were coming back from a playoff game, and I heard him do a – there was a freestyle rap on the plane. There was like a little rap battle. And everyone was having a good time. There were some drinks being shared. And, and he's from like Miami, Miami. And yeah. he, he had a freestyle for about 30 seconds long, and I promise you, I didn't hear one word. I didn't know what, I didn't hear a the, I didn't hear a of. Uh, he's from Miami, Miami. And then of all people, he turned to me, he was like, man, how was that? I was like, it was great. I don't know what you said, but that was great. Uh, he's an awesome human. And then another Florida kid, James Wilder, who I played with in Toronto, out of Florida State. I think he's a Tampa, he's from Tampa Bay. Just a, a, a magnetic human. Um, Powerful person, powerful figure, and, and, and again, loves football. So, Get Wilder and, and Frank Gore are, are two running backs I want to shout out to. That's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. that's great. You answered that perfectly. <laughs> now, if you – so, say you had a, um, a high school quarterback in front of you, whether he's a junior and senior, looking to play college, what, what's some things that you would, you would say to him? Um, I, would, I would sit him down and I would – run a defense and I would say tell me everything you can about this defense and I would see where he's at mm. and I would want I would want somebody to tell me you know under front with a will you know will walked and it looks like it's some sort of three if we invert or out you know what I'm saying like really yeah. talk to understand what's going on on the other side it's something I didn't get at all and I think there's a balance I think that you don't want to make a robot who's who is, you know, so strict on lines and so strict on this, you got to sometimes just throw the open guy. Sometimes it's just dropping back and it's easy as throwing to the open guy, cut the field in half. And when your guy comes open, hit him with the ball. Mm 